Welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of Zeus, um, I would like to say a really warm welcome to um, all the viewers um, to our um, Zeus Forum event. Um, in this last session of the semester, we will have um, another look at Belarus. Um, this time we will focus on the power of theater, photography and public opinion. And I'm very glad to welcome our um, two guests this evening. Natalia Kolyada from the Belarus Free Theater is here with us. Hello, and uh, Misha Friedman. Um, and we are also joined by Gwendolyn Sasse, the Zeus director. Um, as we will start, uh, as we will talk about a very visual and also the theatrical aspects, um, we will kick off with a short presentation so you, that you will actually be able to see um, uh, and get an idea of what we are uh, talking about um, by each of our uh, speakers today. Um, and we will, uh, this will be followed by a discussion. And of course, you're invited to ask your questions uh, via chat. And uh, uh, I will repeat them and I will share them with our speakers um, today. So let me start by just briefly introduce um, our guest today. Uh, Natalia Kolyada is a theater producer and director. In 2005, she founded the Belarus Free Theater together with um, human rights activist and dramatist Nikola Kalesin. Um, later on, the director Vladimir Cherban joined the group and they have established an underground theater in Belarus and um, the which really have um, dealt with repress repressions in their artistic and educational activities um, from the Belarusian state, but who have also met um, international acclaim and found prominent supporters abroad. And the group is now based in UK and works across borders and we will he hear more from herself in a minute. Um, Michelle Friedman is a documentary phot photographer who's based in New York. Um, he was born in Moldova when it was still part of the Soviet Union. He has studies, uh, studied economics, uh, um, economics and Russian politics at London School of um, Economics and became a professional uh, proto photographer only some years later. Um, and besides his documentary work featured in the New York Times, uh, Los Angeles Times and the New Yorker, he has also published five books, all of them on subjects of East, of, in Eastern Europe, based in Eastern Europe. And the most recent is um, Two Women in Their Time, uh, the Belarus Free Theater and the Art of Resistance. And he will talk about this book and his most recent photography that he took in Belarus during the protests later on. And finally, Gwendolyn Sasse is a political scientist and, a, and the scientific director of Zeus. Her research interests include um, comparative democratization and authoritarianism, ethnic conflicts in Eastern Europe and migration from and within Eastern Europe. And recently she has, um, with a team of Zeus researchers, she has launched the project Belarus at the Crossroads public attitudes after the 2020 election. Um, and the first part of this project is a representative uh, survey, online survey, which covers a whole range of um, uh, questions among the attitudes towards the government, trust in other people and institutions, opinions on politics and democracy and civil society and so on. And she will give us some ideas of the initial findings and how they relate to um, what we have seen before. Um, and now, Natalia, I'd ask you to start with your presentation. Yes. Uh, it's a good question. So I see uh, <laughs> this is exactly what we afraid will happen. In of the presentation. Um, it just worked before. Let me have a look. It worked I... perfectly fine. Uh, and uh, because we have terrible internet 
it go through to you. <clears throat> and now it doesn't exist on the... Wow, maybe, do you think we should, do you think you can um, try, do we, uh, we could switch uh, maybe yeah. the order and then we try to yeah. figure out yeah. while okay. um, Misha is presenting. That will be absolutely perfect, then I will get into that. So, yes, um, so Misha, it would be great if you would start and we would find a way. Yeah, um, of course. Um, and before, so I, I'm going to show a few photographs from the book and also from the Belarusian um, protests uh, that I took this, you know, this summer and fall. But uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to kind of, you know, something that I've been thinking about today is, you know, Belarus is, as a journalist, I'm, I'm, keenly aware that countries like Belarus, they fade in and out of news very quickly. Uh, this is the last slide that maybe we should go back to the beginning. Uh, if you could, yeah, if you could scroll back to, uh, please ignore the images while I talk. But, and just because something is not in the news and you have this election and that election and COVID and some other things going on in life doesn't mean that Belarus or what's happening there doesn't just stops. Um, and in the context of this presentation and our talk today, just a couple of basic facts that are happening today in Belarus. For example, uh, one of the actors uh, of the Belarusian Free Theater today or yesterday was sentenced to a 15 day kind of completely arbitrary 15 day uh, jail sentence for just singing a song like at a private a private con concert um and uh, at the same time today there's a trial for two journalists who i know i know one of them very well uh, and they are, they've been in jail for months now, two young women, and their crime is uh, essentially broadcast, they've, you know, what they were doing, they were broadcasting, you know, live streaming protests, doing their job as journalists, and they're now being charged with inciting uh, unrest, um, and they're facing at the very least, uh, you know, a, a two-year sentence uh, in, in prison, you know, and that's this kind of, this is the everyday reality of Belarus uh, at the moment. Just throwing this out there. Um, about the pictures. So I'll start with a few photographs from the book. Uh, so this is the cover of, and it has, uh, you know, Sriata and Nadia, my two protagonists. Um, and uh, yeah, if we could go, just go on. <laughs> I'll quickly go. I won't bore you with photos too much in the beginning. Yeah, so this is Sriata. Next. Uh, so that's, this is a rehearsal. Uh, one kind of be, not being a theater person it took me i was i was just, i was told uh, many many times before i memorized it that you should never say practice you should always say rehearsal that in theater we don't practice we rehearse so this is a rehearsal of uh, of uh, one of the plays uh, that uh, theater performs uh, abroad mainly uh, it's called burning doors uh, that's what the stage looks like the one interesting thing about, and I'm gonna kind of talk about it more, is how, again, often what you see is you see that you in 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 most places around the world you have an event, let's say a protest or an assassination or a football game or 
a life imported and life event, and then you have artists through their different artistic means re repeating this event in their art and kind of showing the world what had happened and their interpretations of the art. What has been strange to me in Belarus is that for a couple of years I photographed, you know, different plays. All almost all were very kind of political in nature, while Minsk, at least on surface, remained calm. And what was really odd to see this summer was how, you know, it's a cliche phrase and you shouldn't repeat it too much, but it was really like life, Im life imitating art, not the other way around, where some of the things that I saw in theater would, uh, would play out uh, themselves out, you know, in reality. And uh, so that's kind of, yeah. So that, this is a play, um, let's keep going. Uh, this was a couple of years ago when the Ukrainian uh, film director was imprisoned in Russia and part of the performance or at the end of the performances, uh, theater company would, would uh, engage in kind of additional kind of activism asking audience members to kind of remember this guy's name and, and, and talk about it online and whatnot. And he was ultimately released uh, and sent back to, to Ukraine. So in that sense, this campaign was a part of a huge success. This is Nadia on the trolley bus, because why not? Uh, so this is what one interesting con contrast with this theater company is that while they play in some of the most important and iconic uh, theaters and stages around the world and festivals back in Minsk, uh, their play, the only place where they could play is very humble. It's a small kind of a garage uh, in, a, in a outskirts of town. And that's where people kind of are directed to coming. And that's what you see here is kind of people leaving, the, leaving this garage after uh, after the after the play and it also i want to say that it's kind of sometimes people ask why do they play certain plays abroad while doing can they have a different repertoire in belarus i think some of it has to do with logistics and well you know with certain like especially like ambitious plays that you could only do you know like in the proper theater just physically impossible to do back home. And uh, I included this slide, even though it's not in the book, but it has a, it has Natalia's head on the screen in it. So this was kind of a common, uh, <laughs> uh, hi Natasha. Uh, so this is a common um, thing that happens after plays in Minsk where audience stays inside this shack for a post-production kind of discussion of what they saw, and which includes uh, kind of the founding members of Natalia and Nikolai, her husband, who kind of are artistic directors of the theater. Uh, again, the type of play that uh, just dif different plays, uh, same little room. Uh, sometimes uh, you have like fairly kind of well-known uh, people join the cast for kind of special, you know, plays that have, you know, when there's a good reason for it. This is uh, Maria Alekhina uh, of Pussy Riot, who is just, again, during rehearsals. Uh, and uh, she's also on the house arrest right now um, in Moscow. Yeah. So the one thing you learn about working in countries like Russia and Belarus is that photograph everyone because there's a good chance that at some point they will end up uh, in how, uh, you know, under house arrest or worse. And uh, th th their images may be useful later. Uh, again, this is from a play. Uh, sometimes they perform outdoors. So this is someone's backyard, uh, about an hour outside of Minsk and kind of an impromptu theater. Uh, this was fun. Uh, this is uh, Sveta and Nadia in, actually what's interesting is that this was in Kiev and 
throughout the time I was with them, you could kind of see how much more relaxed they were as a couple, you know, like in Western countries, like places like Finland and New York and Toronto that I saw them. But I thought that it was really interesting how, you know, they, how much also relaxed they were in places like Kiev where like from a distance, you know, doesn't feel that much different, at least on, on the metro from Minsk, but even in a post-Soviet country like Ukraine that had, until a few years ago had its own problems, uh, you know, with, with no LGBT marches and whatnot, how much more relaxed they felt where they could just kind of do this, uh, you know, something that was kind of more or less inconceivable, you know, back home. Uh, Nadia at home. Uh, they live about an hour from Minsk. Uh, I love this fact that it's in a village with no name, which they told me that they picked, they like, kind of one was one of the reasons why they liked living there. And it's about, it's kind of a strategic place where it's kind of a halfway to Lithuania. And it has no name and it's between managing a theater company which is, you know, you are, you're both a stage manager and accountant, a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, kind of your everything to the actors. Like it's uh, kind of, it's important to have that their own peace of mind. And uh, it came especially away from everyone. And it came especially handy last summer because they were arrested. And after spending a few days in, uh, you know, like some of the worst during the worst period of the crackdown in jail, you know, that's, you know, I think they were kind of in a way lucky to have that space, which we could go back to and shut down and attempt to rebuild their uh, psyche, which will take a while. Um, yeah, this is, the, this is them at home. Uh, the home is there. It's still kind of under construction. So these are some of the images from the book. And then if I'm, I'm, if I apologize if I'm taking too long, but I'll run through a few photos from, uh, from the summer. So this is during the protest, uh, during one of the women marches. Uh, I think uh, I, this is a portrait of uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, uh, presidential candidate. I like this picture. Uh, this is why like, I included this was, so this was at the, at the, you know, sometimes, you know, like as a photographer, you chase images and then you walk and then you see stuff and nothing's going on. And then sometimes images just find you. Here, what was kind of cute and special was that she was at, at the studio a few days before elections recording on the last campaign message. And the people who run the studio felt that they wanted to raise her a little bit. So they had a couple of old books on which they asked her to stand. And they randomly gave her uh, two copies. I swear this was not intentional of the uh, great uh, Soviet encyclopedia, uh, <laughs> which they found particularly like kind of, um, and I, you know, as a, I, this was just, they, they were not in the frame, like during, you know, like for the compare for her purposes, but for me, I thought this was kind of gold and very symbolic uh, in its, uh, yeah, in what it looked like. So this was uh, on the evening after the elections uh, and you could kind of see the tensions rising uh, and what's about to happen. Yeah, this was kind of, people were still kind of, did not think that something would terrible were about to happen and uh, you could kind of sense like a kind of this was like a you know like you see like a, a cloud uh, on the horizon uh, that's uh, and you know it's time to go and that this was a few minutes after yeah yeah this was still during the time where you could a, you, with a press pass, you could still photograph things like that. You know, within a few days, you could no, you no longer could. And as an American, it was particularly striking to, you know, like on the one hand, you have BLM and all these 
problems that my country is going through in the States, but then you get to Minsk and it's a completely different level. So this was a whole, this was a, a scene, something out of Solzhenitsyn, like uh, where you have relatives, there's no other way to describe it. Uh, you know, you have relatives waiting for any kind of news. This was still when the internet was down and kind of an ambulance would transport some of the more grave, more, you know, like, most like sick you know worst be beaten people out of the prison into a hospital and relatives would storm this ambulance and try to find out any kind of information of who is inside just get you know asking the driver for a last name for a surname just again something that you kind of you'd read in textbooks about you know the purges or gulags and just could not believe what we were witnessing this was a few days later doing protests and you see kind of a column of people kind of going to our city center and I kind of like how this woman, she's a supporter, but she's really worried because it's kind of, as a photographer, it's very easy to, and not very easy, but on an intellectual level to kind of separate the, like the good and the bad, the white from black and here are the good guys and the bad guys, but you also look for these kind of moments in between and because there's all this talk about unity and how the regime is going to fall any day but the reality is a little bit more complicated than that yeah this was uh yeah kind of one of those pictures that i think speaks for itself and i'd be later i'd be happy to answer specific questions about them yeah, this was very symbolic for me as well, because on the one hand, this was a protest and a group of women came to lay flowers and be at the symbolic site in Minsk. And then, then I raised my camera to, to photograph this woman. She asked, she was, she asked not to be like, you know, she asked for her face to be obscured and put this placard and obscured her face herself, like this was not set up. And I thought that was very sad and symbolic while how on the one hand, you hear and see this movement, but then people are still very much afraid. And this was still in August. Yeah. This was a funeral for one of the dead. Uh, this is a grandmother, she was her grandson. Same funeral. That's his. That's the dead. Uh, the dead guy's uh, wife. Uh, uh, again, this was one of those in-between moments where you have some protest or protesters are already kind of burying their dead, while others, you know, they support the movement, and you see this flag, um, like inside her car. But then she's, you know, she's inside her, her comfortable, very kind of not, you know, very expensive German car, windows up, kind of supporting, but still not ready to leave her car. And I thought that was, that was very kind of symbolic, that was a very symbolic scene for me and something that you would not normally read in news reports. This was, uh, again, a women's protest and uh, kind of brave women and some like cops and KGB agents filming and harassing them. Uh, again, this looked like something out of, I don't know, pick, a, pick any world war, you know, I'll let you be historians, one, two, three, four, but this looked like with the architecture and the formation looked like something out, something that I saw in the movies before. And yeah, very scary. Um, again, as a photographer, I like things like that where you have these kind of still moments of daily life and a nice kind of a cafe in town and this woman in kind of enjoying her beverage and a cigarette while barbed wires across the street. It was just, again, something, something from the movies. Yeah, and um, yeah, this is uh, this is this is that. Thank you.
So thank you for uh, for showing for sharing this with us, Nisha. And I think I've um, I already have some thoughts about where, for example, Gwendolyn might um, Gwendolyn's uh, research might um, connect in. Natalia, do, um, have you managed to let me let let us try oh. to see yeah. if the internet is more friendly with us now. Thanks. Great. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, and I think like, of course, like uh, Misha gave such a brilliant um, background story of what's happening in Belarus. Uh, and I start exactly from the day, uh, the 9th of August. Uh, and this is exactly realities where Belarus Free Theater operates. And um, it didn't start to operate uh, in secret uh, only on the 9th of August of 2020, because the company exists underground already for 15 years. And only uh, my husband and me, uh, we are political refugees in the UK. But the company, the rest of the company, all our actors, students, managers, they operate on a daily basis in Belarus. Uh, we, in uh, our personal situation, uh, had uh, to become refugees. We didn't plan for that. Uh, but I was released uh, out of jail in 2010 and got smuggled out together with my family um, to perform in New York. And if, if it wasn't the show in New York, uh, we will never leave. And what will happen, we don't know. I'm sure we will just end up in jail because there were seven criminal cases in between uh, my husband and me. But uh, currently uh, we talk about the company and not, that, not about us. And uh, the situation in Belarus was like that for 26 years of dictatorship. And in those conditions where uh, our friends been kidnapped and killed, uh, we established the company uh, and it's happened um, on the 30th of March of 2005. And we thought that we will go underground uh, from the very beginning. We started uh, to perform we started uh, to establish the main international competition of contemporary drama because we thought that contemporary playwrights, they're the best X-ray machines of any society. And uh, that was a possibility for us to inform population inside of Belarus, but also to inform people outside of Belarus. And on top of it, uh, we educate. We have our own school that is called Fortin Brass, where we teach uh, students, uh, of course, for free, because in uh, conditions of Belarus, our main aim is to change situation. And it has to be done via uh, educating people, uh, critical thinking. And that's exactly what we've been doing for all years of our existence. And um, we are uh, uh, one of those pioneers who uh, came up with artivism. Uh, we merged uh, art and activism together. And uh, in order uh, for our students to understand how to take a specific taboo subject of society and put it into contemporary art uh, form and take it to people. And also we are campaigning theater. Every single show that we have, uh, will have its own campaign. And we are the only theater banned by its own government uh, based on political grounds. Uh, and when we campaign, uh, for example, if we have the show about death penalty, because uh, Europe on the list of continents only because of Belarus, in Belarus, people continue to be executed. Uh, they are, when they're executed, it is, uh, uh, they are shot from gun into the back head and their body never found, uh, never given to any family. And uh, they're buried in a specific location that nobody knows. So if we have a show and we have a show that is called Trash Cuisine that talks about all continents, including Europe, 
where Belarus is located, where capital punishment exists. We have our campaign that is called um, Give a Body Back Campaign. All the years of existence led us into 2020. And uh, before uh, the 9th of August, uh, and that was happening on the 9th of August, uh, these are photos of uh, different brave uh, photographers who took uh, photos and amazing courage of people uh, who stood up against uh, the regime. Uh, and uh, everything what led to the 9th of August of 2020 in the situation of Belarus Free Theater, uh, we started, we resumed uh, our shows face to face um, on the 2nd of July. And it's happened exactly, and maybe this photos of Misha, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, that particular situation um, when our audience got in touch with us and they said, can you please start to perform uh, again to us? Because before the elections, already 1,000 people got arrested. So we started to perform uh, because our audience told us that images of our shows, they keep them going in jails. And this is exactly that particular moment when you understand that um, this is uh, exactly the meaning of theater and this is the essence of theater. Here I stop at that particular picture. This is our actress uh, Dasha Andrianova and our actor. Um, we have uh, a show uh, with disabled people. Uh, that was also raided by police. Uh, Dasha was in jail uh, together with Sveta and Nadia, our managing directors, uh, about who Misha made a book. And uh, on the 9th of August, everything got changed uh, and uh, our actors continued to be the most incredible people uh, who I know. Uh, part of them went to re by rivers on a raft to the most rural areas of Belarus to inform people by show, uh, by performance that was called Tsa Tsa. It's about bad Tsa and good people who stood up against uh, him. And they will arrive by a raft uh, to a riverside and they will start to perform. And after the show, they will get together with people. They will make a dinner and they will discuss what's happening. Uh, in Minsk in reality, because in rural areas of Belarus, there is, there is no internet and only official TV exists. It means that there is no true information. Um, and uh, same time, it was uh, incredible time in terms of courtyards performances. Uh, this is exactly direct democracy model. Uh, there are lots of telegram channels in Belarus, uh, in Minsk, and when uh, people will request uh, Belarus Free Theater and other, many other artists to come and perform. And people in courtyards, they will provide uh, food to artists, they will provide um, even full security. When our actors have been arriving to perform uh, their show, they will have a specific van prepared, uh, waiting with the driver. If police arrives, um, then straight away, actors will be taken by that van to a safe location, and they will spend time in the uh, apartments of uh, people in order for actors to go home at the morning when it will be safe. These are those unique moments of uh, community and uh, direct democracy. This is the tent where our actors been performing and uh, changing uh, their costumes, if it's possible to say, uh, behind the tent. Incredible attendance uh, and what was happening uh, like real amazing moment that uh, it was attended by kids. Uh, Belarus we see at the shows, they are never for kids. Uh, they are to shake adults and understand uh, 
adults need to take major responsibilities in order to change society. But uh, our actors made adaptation of uh, existing shows that was accessible for kids. And it was the most incredible uh, moments because uh, at that particular moment, you understand if we're able to educate uh, kids, there will be a possibility to educate the nation and build up the future of the nation. And you could see that incredible connection in between audience, uh, young audience and actors. Stand with Belarus was created by Belarus Free Theater together with our partners. What was incredible in terms of solidarity uh, with Belarus. And it was exactly, uh, was artistic message because we campaign and it was one of the possible ways for us to continue campaign and how to attract attention to Belarus. We um, got in touch with our major partners all over the world with venues where we performed and they light up their buildings into white, red, white colors, into colors of uh, the flag that is prohibited by Belarusian authorities. This is the uh, London Globe where we also performed King Lear at uh, Olympic Games of 2012. This is uh, New York La Mama. And this is Brussels uh, Bozar Museum of Contemporary Arts, English uh, Royal, Royal Opera House. And uh, in terms of Belarus, we continue to perform um, our shows uh, every single week. Uh, and uh, these are two shows, Discover Love and uh, Time of Women. I will move into that one uh, next. Uh, Discover Love talks about kidnappings and murders in Belarus, kidnappings of our friends. Uh, but this particular piece talks about love story of our friend with her husband. They lived together 25 years, but uh, they didn't celebrate their wedding. Unfortunately, uh, because uh, Irina's husband was kidnapped and killed by Belarusian authorities. And uh, uh, this particular year uh, in January, it was leaked tape that uh, Lukashenko hired murders to opponents outside of Belarus, not only inside of Belarus. Um, this is the show Discover Love. And Time of Women, uh, the show about three women who end up in KGB jail. Uh, and it's uh, one of unique experience for us when audience get back to us and they say, thank you so much for your show because we understood how we need to behave with KGB interrogator. And of course, when you create a show, you never think that your audience will learn from the show that how to behave with interrogator of KGB and uh, where you need to find the place uh, where to sleep in a cell. And this is exactly that particular moment when a third woman was um, taken to the jail and there was uh, not enough uh, space in a cell and there was only possible to put uh, kind of a wooden big plate uh, under the bunk bed and for her to sleep on the floor. And also what is horrific these days that audience, when they released out of jails, they say that we appreciate that you helped us to understand what would where to sleep when we are arrested. But also this show talks about resilience of women um, and it's another major hope that is brought by the show uh, that women in jail uh, request makeup because they want to go to uh, speak to interrogator in a full way makeup in order to show that they're strong. This is how our shows take place in Belarus, uh, when in apartments with audiences uh, sitting on uh, benches on the floor. Um, and exactly it's a time of women's show again in other conditions. And
and it's just simple apartment of our friend who accommodated our show. And Benny Do's show, it's uh, Misha spoke about that show already, and it was idea to speak about artist in the Russian jail, but performed by Belarusian artists who went through repressions. And uh, Masha Alukhina performed in that show, and also it was dedicated to Pyotr Pavlensky and uh, Oleg Sinsov. Um, these are those particular moments of the show where we try together with Nikolai uh, to achieve that impact uh, when it was necessary for our actors to overcome body limits uh, and exist on stage uh, when they understand that physically it's almost not possible for them to already exist. And it was the idea, this is how we could have a possibility to share with our audience what it means to go through tortures. Pasha Garadnitsky, uh, who is in jail now while we are talking. Uh, he got 15 days in jail yesterday. And uh, another actor of Belarus Free Theater who performed in many of our shows, uh, also uh, Pavel's colleague and their music band. Uh, that is called A Broken Heart of a Boy, was raided on Saturday and uh, 53 people got arrested. Pavel and Denis are now in jail. This is those moments when you could see very closely that uh, it is a huge physical resilience and pressure that actors need to go, to go through on stage in order to share um, body limits uh, with audience. And this is the moment when two Russian uh, bureaucrats are discussing how um, to give sentence, uh, jail sentence to Pussy Riot. And this is the show that uh, we performed in Minsk uh, and um, it's called Dogs of Europe and it talks about the future. It's a dystopia. Uh, it talks about uh, very nearest future 2049. It starts in 2019 when children put uh, their thoughts in time capsule. And the main character who put his thought in the time capsule finds it in 2049. But unfortunately, by that time, Russia built up a new Reich uh, and uh, Europe became almost gray zone that stopped reading books. And it's about uh, in when uh, people see how their rights are taken from them, but they think that uh, it will pass. And unfortunately, it will not pass and uh, dictatorial states will simply act on time now. It's exactly what's happening in Belarus, in Russia uh, these days and with the whole Eurasia uh, region and many countries of the world. And I'm with the band. Uh, that's uh, one of our artistic actions that we did uh, in London uh, because uh, Lukashenko seized all paintings of one um, possible presidential candidate, Viktor Babarika, and the trial uh, against him will take place tomorrow. Uh, and uh, he was the person who brought major Belarusian contemporary uh, art um, from different auctions. Uh, and he brought that back to Belarus. And um, Eva, uh, this is one of the most famous uh, contemporary pieces. And it was seized uh, by Belarusian authorities. And uh, we put that into um, uh, that particular artistic stand. And we dressed up Eva in, into her face, but also into jail rope uh, and went through uh, then to Belarusian embassy to organize protest uh, there. This is 
this particular moment, we stay in front of the Belarusian embassy. And uh, in the end, we undressed from costumes and became those people who stand up against uh, Belarusian regime and authorities. Um, and this is uh, how it's happening in Belarus. And of course, I could say about Belarus free theater that uh, we use that frame of uh, Boris Groitz, who reframed Dostoevsky, that the art uh, will save the world. But uh, Boris Groitz is very close to us and our uh, motto saying that uh, the art will save the world from beauty. Because uh, where we live now, in those conditions we live, uh, there is no beauty left uh, because it's just um, absolutely horrifying uh, torture. In Belarus, uh, more than 35,000 people got arrested. Uh, 600 uh, artists, if we just talk about artists, uh, around 500 journalists uh, who lost their accreditation uh, and uh, trials go every single day, uh, tortures, rape uh, happened in Belarus and the rest take place every single day. So in this particular moment, we understand that uh, and continue our major campaign that we started more than five years ago, we lobbied United Nations that artists will be recognized as human rights defenders because what artists do in those conditions um, as uh, we have in Belarus or Russia or Ukraine recently. Uh, it only means that uh, artists play that major uh, human rights defenders role. Thank you. Thank you for this outlook, even though if, um, you ended now with a dystopia. And I, I think uh, I don't want to put the, to let this question um, until the very end, um, but uh, that's why I want to ask you right now before I uh, give the word uh, to Gwendolyn. Um, what you just described now was, you know, um, after a few months into the protests and um, how, that were that were quelled and and the repressions. Um, I wonder how you. Um, um, how you experienced um, August? Did you did you see it as a, as a change? Uh, I mean, of course. Did you see it as a as a um, um, a rupture, or was it something that uh, that you expected? And also, in your view um, of how you work with art, did it um, did you change your perspective on on how you viewed art, or was it more a confirmation of what you? Um, so because you said you would, um, it was an X-ray machine uh, for a society. We didn't expect. Uh, I think nobody expected what happened. But for Belarusian situation, it was existential crisis. Um, it was life and death situation, because first of all, uh, economy almost collapsed. Then, uh, secondly, coronavirus situation when Lukashenko denied the fact of existence of coronavirus. And uh, after that, when people started um, to stay in queues to give their signatures to register presidential candidates, and when uh, people doing that for days and um, heavy rain. And then Lukashenko is announcing that um, uh, all those uh, people didn't uh, put their signatures for specific candidates. It means that he doesn't recognize existence of people in general. He doesn't recognize existence of Belarusian population. And clearly it became that major existential crisis for Belarusian people. In terms of the arts, uh, it's very interesting in terms of um, uh, in terms of the dynamic that happened, because uh, for 15 years we've been educating our audiences and that was our main mission, uh, educate, perform, work together and change from uh, uh, bystanders into active participants. And this happened uh, last summer. 
and currently I could say that we are there um, to be a support, uh, but in terms of creativity, uh, creativity of Belarusian population is just really mind blowing. And this is where we could see that um, it's a major, a major creativity happening among people and they're leading on it. It's not artists who are leading on it, but people. Thank you. I think, Wendelin, this might be a good point for you to come in with your uh, research or some of it. For some reason, I can't go to the presentation mode. Wait a minute. If five won't work, go to the uh, um, to the very top and to the small uh, board with the with the arrow. Even further up, further up. It doesn't. Normally, it's there, but ah. it doesn't actually show it. <laughs> it's disappeared. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but I mean, we are seeing uh, the presentation only just. Okay. Not in the full That's screen just, mode. I don't know, something's happened to the screen. Let me just um, start that way then. Um, I mean, also listening to, to you both, Natalia and, and, and Misha, I was um, thinking again how our very different approaches and experiences of, of um, the, the events now in, in Belarus, uh, I think, speak to each other. And of course, the perspective I'm uh, going to try and add is one that is much more detached and I'm observing from the outside. But we try to, I think, in some ways, pick up from the work you do, be it through kind of theater as also political engagement and activism, and also capturing the images and the stories, the inv individuals that you showed in your photography, Misha. And if we think of what a sociological survey does, then on the one hand, it's um, maybe a bit like aerial photography of protests. It's a bird's eye view, and we, in a way, hover over uh, the events and over society at large. Um, but on the other hand, it also is, I think, in line with what you both try to engage in and, and, and capture, which is um, kind of to look at society's basis. So looking from the, from the ground up. So we're interested in this um, survey and sociological work more generally, um, not in uh, the individual as such, but society at large, and maybe also aim to, to therefore detect patterns of what all of this might mean for society at large beyond some of the, the powerful um, images that, that you have shown. And, and I think our, our survey, survey that we uh, conducted online in December 2020 um, that captures uh, about 2000 people, uh, the age groups covered are 16 to 64, simply because it is um, difficult or impossible to capture um, the older uh, age category beyond that systematically with an online survey. So that is a certain caveat. We capture inhabitants of citizens with over uh, cities with over 20,000 inhabitants. And our methodology is a quota sample. So it's representative for age, gender, and place of residence. Um, and I think it is one of the the first or few um, surveys out there that try to to look at society at large or within those parameters as I define them and if we maybe first of all start with who who protested according to this um, survey um, the question was um, did you take part in protests in Belarus this year or in the past years so this is protest activity more generally we see 18 percent um, said they did um, if we zoom in more specifically to, into the protests um, around and after the elections last year, uh, we go down to about 14%. That might at first glance look like a small proportion, but calculated over the, the whole of society and what we capture, the part of society we capture with the survey, about 5 million um, Belarusians, and that is um, a significant number, that's about 700,000. And it is also obvious that always only a minority of the population overall would, will be visible in the streets. 
But it, I think an interesting indicator too is, and this is really what I, I, I want to emphasize with some of the data I'm showing you, um, is what is going on is a much wider politicization of society beyond what we have seen in the streets. And maybe that, that message becomes even more important as we are uh, receiving fewer images, um, meaning in particular, I'm sitting in Berlin. So now that life and work is so much difficult also for photographers, to capture images, we also, I think, hear less about it. But actually now looking at who knows about um, uh, protests, it's a very high number um, in society. So we hear, um, uh, see that about 48%, so about half the, um, the respondents um, say they've heard about, they know protesters. And so this is knowing, is, is maybe a little bit like that image of um, the person with the flag sitting in, in the car, so they, they probably know people engaged, but they haven't engaged themselves. So this highlights something broader than, even broader than the mass mobilization we see or we have seen in the streets. What is also important, I think, to recognize is, and, and again, this is not surprising, but I think it's good to, to get a handle on it and try to understand it, um, is that there's a diversity of views on the protests. So even with mass mobilization going on, we, we can't say that everybody is in, in favor of what is happening in the streets. So I think we need to, to frame that a bit by, by seeing what people think about these protests. And we can um, uh, group the responses here. The first two, uh, about 45% um, see the protests of our respondents, see the pro protests positively. About 31% see them negatively if we group um, completely agree and somewhat agree, and on the other hand, completely disagree and somewhat disagree. But we also see um, just under 20% who say they don't know. We also, by the way, always gave a possibility to refuse to answer a particular question because these are sensitive times also for conducting um, surveys. Um, so we see a diversity, but we also see um, uh, more support for um, the protests. Um, we ask questions that also get at politicization of, of society in a different way by asking about political interest. And maybe this is partly what Nadia was talking, Natalia was talking about um, in, in, in terms of how many more people seem to be um, engaged and took what they um, tried in, in the underground theater now into the streets. So this is about political interest. And we can see a marked increase. This is the self-perception of respondents that they, the orange bar, that they became more interested in politics in recent months. Uh, about a third, the green um, uh, bar at the beginning here suggests um, uh, that interest has not changed for a third of society. So we don't know if, if they were interested or not. But the key element I would highlight here is that something has, has started to stir. And this is again beyond the actual protesters. Um, that um, an interest in politics is uh, the beginning of um, um, something important, even if the outcome is, is, is open. Um, something that we found staggering in this survey is if we look at media use, we've, we've all realized, I think, that how important social media and in particular Telegram has been um, during these protests and also just as a source of information. But if we see the, the difference here, um, over 70% uh, told us, and this is across age groups, it is more pronounced among the younger, but not, um, this is not, this figure is not only the young, 70% told us in the survey that social media and online media are their main source of information. That's the long blue bar. If you go to the very top, that's Belarusian state television, and that's uh, the, the first place, the first choice, uh, the, uh, the main source of information is the dark blue and in second place, the light blue. So only 10% said that state television is their main source of information um, at this point in time. So that's a, that's a staggering uh, shift in, we don't know what it was like before um, August with this data, but um, that tells you something I think about um, where people now get information from. And that again is not, at least not along um, uh, state, uh, state lines. When we asked about the best political outcome or what would be supported as an outcome of the current events, we see that new elections um, comes out top, followed by constitutional reforms and transfer of power to the Coordination Council, the um, somewhat more institutionalized uh, body or institution of the, of the opposition if we um, use that term for simplicity's sake. 
this is a rather full graph, but let me just um, highlight a couple of things. If it's about political and economic expectations of society now. So the question was uh, what the main, the three main priorities of um, political leadership should be after the um, current um, crisis. And uh, you can see the three green bars uh, standing out, uh, the defense of Belarusian independence, um, giving Belarusian citizens a real voice in the political process, but and also improvement of my living standards. So those uh, three concerns together were the, the predominant ones among the first um, answers given. Now, another graph I, or another result I personally find interesting if we ask, um, uh, abbreviated it here, support for democracy, but it was actually a more um, nuanced way of phrasing it, authoritarian and democratic forms of government and which ones are more appropriate or which ones do you prefer? We see on the on the one hand um, uh, majority support for democracy in the sense of agreeing with the statement democracy is preferable to any other kind of government, the green bar. Under certain circumstances, an authoritarian government can be preferable is the orange bar, 13%. Um, and for people like me, it doesn't matter is the is the purple blue bar. But then I think what is important, and, and that requires, I think, more analysis, but also more thought, um, uh, that 30% say they don't know. So that suggests that the idea, the notion of um, democracy is still not really necessarily filled with concrete um, uh, content. So I think that is um, uh, something that, that um, also suggests ways in which I think political engagement, be it through theater, be it through other forms, um, taking this forward can perhaps fill um, that notion with more um, content or concrete content. And I want to just end with one slide on, on migration um, uh, pressure. Um, I've also been involved in a um, survey of protesters themselves. So that's an ongoing um, uh, survey that we conducted since April of just the protesters. And there we were already um, in some ways surprised that 20, over 20% 20 of those who, who participated said they are thinking of, of leaving the country. Those are the ones most engaged at the moment. But if we think about this um, across society within the, the age groups I, I mentioned up to 64, we also see near to nearly 50% uh, um, say they're thinking of leaving their city, if we break that down further, most of them are planning or would like to migrate to uh, EU countries and followed by uh, Russia. So um, kind of a divided answer there, but it's uh, mostly not migration within uh, Belarus. So I, I leave it here with this um, snapshot and I look forward to the discussion. Yes, I think um, although we are a little um, over uh, um, the planned time, we still uh, should take some time um, to exchange uh, some views. It seems uh, uh, very uh, different, and it seems to be very different angles that uh, that you presented here. But I think there are a lot of links. And uh, first of all, um, the, uh, something you try to capture, uh, Misha, in your um, uh, photographs, this moment of. Um, that realities are more complicated. Uh, they're uh, thinking of the image of the woman who was worried, you know, and uh, beside uh, the protest, uh, par uh, still sh sharing views, being part of the protest, but still had some, um, of course, uh, uh, well, other worries on, on her mind. So that the question of unity is not that simple. And uh, this, this diversity of views was also shown in the was also shown in the um, survey. So this is um, also something that is very uh, difficult, of course, because op opinion polls are actually um, hardly possible in Belarus. And uh, so how can the public actually come to a sense of itself? So how can um, people in Belarus get, a, get an idea of um, yeah, the general, the public opinion? And is this something that happened in 2020? Um, I was uh, wondering if one could describe this as something that has happened, that there was a formation um, of some sort of... 
Uh, uh, before I answer this question, uh, I just uh, uh, something about the surveys and the, the, mm -hmm. the age groups, something that's kind of anecdotal, but it came up time after time in my reporting trips around the country is how a lot of grandkids ended up getting their grandma's iPads or kind of tablets for the first time in their lives because they wanted to, and a lot of these grandmas were in their seventies. And it was like, I personally witnessed a few of these situations where grand, because state TV was not reporting much, but you know, they wanted to know what was happening. And it was the most, you know, I, I remember being at this grandma's home uh, in uh, about an hour, an hour and a half from Minsk. And when the, when I was reporting the story for the Guardian, we asked her, how was she getting news? She said, and this is a woman, she was, I believe she was 72. She said, well, I read all the telegram channels, like my grandson here installed it for me. And then my colleague asked Sean Walker, who's like the main Eastern European correspondent, was like, so, but how do you, what do you do for pictures? You know, how do you, you know, how could you see? Because on Telegram, it's just text. And she just kind of looked at us like we were like illiterate, I don't know, children. And she's just like, Instagram live. <laughs> we were like, it just floored us, you know, like here's this like woman in her 70s like, educating us. Of course, Instagram live, because that's what we do. You know, <laughs> so there is a group, and I think that group is quite is bigger than we are able to capture, and uh, especially during the kind of the informational kind of lockdown, they a lot of them, of course, not everyone, because it required for their children or grandchildren to be politically active, but those who were um, did, in fact, try to get to kind of educate their kind of their older relatives in kind of modern technology. So even mm -hmm. though we kind of not in the survey. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, again, from my reporting and I'm kind of not in a position to kind of advise or speak on behalf of Belarusians or all journalists, but just being there, it kind of raised you know, there is some questions, you know, and now in Russia and in Belarus is like, what can society do? Like, you know, because in, you know, in places like, I don't know, if you look at the Arab Spring protests, you know, with unemployment here, you know, in countries like Egypt, you know, at 40, 45%, you know, according, you know, there's a real sense that you could measure, you know, of, country being unfair, you know, of a society being unfair, where you you have all the right education and everything, and you'll still not get a job. You still have no chance to achieve anything in your home country. But what do you, and that leads to kind of a, a revolution and what happened there. But what hap, what can peaceful people do in a society where unemployment is not 40%, where majority of the blue collar workers and to a certain extent, kind of white collar educated, you know, IT kind of heavily based individuals. You know, if you don't consider politics to be that important and until the last year it was not, um, what can people do? Like what, when you have a, when you live in a dictatorship that has crossed every line, you know, of decency and decent decency, and uh, has is ready to kill and imprison and do every, where there is no going back. What can people do? What could peaceful protests do? What could you do when sanctions are can only go so far? You know, like what could we people do when the price? of protesting is death or jail or your life will be ruined, just very practically speaking. And it's a very, when, but at the same time where if you do shut your mouth, you could theoretically keep going about your life. 
And, uh, you know, if you're a blue collar worker and you think like three, 400 euros a month is a decent wage. And for generations, they, be, they have been trained to think that it is, that they're not even ready to sacrifice that. Mm-hmm. And they're not ready to risk it. Like what can, what, what can be done, you know? And it's a question that, you know, like almost no one, I don't know anyone that has a kind of a good answer for it. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you protest, you do this, you do that, and you're tired and it's winter and you see all this stress in which you're living in. And that, but then you have people in power or a person in power and his henchmen who have more or less said that, no, nope, they don't care, you know, because they are protecting themselves, their relatives, their clans, their, you know, they, they have nowhere to run and they're, they're willing to do everything. Uh, they don't have any assets abroad or very few of them do that really worries them because they have no plan B. Mm-hmm. Like what could people do? Yeah. Um, Gwendolyn, uh, do, do you, uh, from the surveys, did you think, uh, was there, did an image of a, like a new generation uh, emerge or um, of, a, of a change? You mentioned a change in political interest. I mean, that is something that will not go away, I think, I guess. Can I, can I just add, sorry, just add one more thing uh, before. Uh, this was kind of very interesting observation that a colleague made on the August 9th uh, about the new generation. I was out there and seeing this crowd and my colleague mentioned that something that I would not have picked up. She said, notice how few flags, you know, the, the white you know, the white and red flags out there. Because before last year, the flag was by young people associated the flag with like this older, generation of protesters who are either in exile or in jail or just kind of this sad old kind of boomers, losers, whatnot, who were not successful in Tapu and Lukashenko or nationalists. And the fact that there were so few flags on the first day of protest was a sign to people who have experience in protesting in, in Belarus before that this is a very new group of people, that these people are not there because of the flag. They're not there because there's, there may be nationalists. They're there because they're 22 and they're there for other reasons. You know, it's a new wave. It's not the same old group that has been protesting since the nineties. So it took a few days and then the flag was everywhere and now it's in all the photographs. But if you carefully look at the images of the very first night, that was assigned to kind of the old timers, kind of the old revolutionaries, the dissidents, that this is something else. This is a different group of people. And it was a kind of an uplifting moment to my colleagues. And I thank my, my uh, local kind of colleagues for pointing this little but crucial detail that I would not have been able to pick up uh, without them. Um, uh, Gwendolyn, sorry, uh, Natalia yeah. told me that she uh, uh, has to leave uh, and because, of course, we are actually taking a little bit longer, but I wanted to ask you, of course, another question before you have to go. Um, before uh, we uh, come back to the question of uh, the new generation, I, I found it really impressive, um, impressive how you described the feedback you got from the people um, uh, in Belarus who, ha- who were... Um, talking about how your your images, your theater helped them, you know, in their political struggle. Um, because you, as you said in the beginning, theater has this tradition of uh, reflecting on, on, on political uh, representation. And I, I, um, I wanted to ask you something else about how, um, how you, uh, um, how the, the, reflection on Belarus abroad has changed. I mean, you are also um, working internationally, you are giving, um, is there, a, have you um, noticed a, a change in how how the in, interest in Belarus, of course, um, uh, was raised and um, 
And uh, how do you, uh, in general, how do you get those two audiences or publics together? Do you do you work with the same um, stories, or is it something completely different? Uh, we have uh, our slogan is modern theater, and that explains everything. Uh, because we work through the whole society and we work uh, with all layers of society and our idea is uh, that uh, we need to have um, absolutely fantastic quality uh, performance or documentary or concert but same time uh, by that we will open uh, doors to our audiences because our audiences are very different people. These are journalists, politicians, uh, uh, and uh, all those uh, people have a major impact in uh, their areas. And that way we're able, uh, besides uh, performing arts and besides uh, multimedia to engage with um, politicians and work on uh, high level advocacy uh, also work uh, uh, solution-based, uh, research-based, investigative journalism. Uh, we do briefings for different governments. But in terms of Belarus, um, it got changed uh, the first few months. But uh, if I talk uh, about the beginning of this year, it will be pretty uh, unfortunate news because when I'm talking to different people in Brussels, in EU, uh, it's uh, very difficult to hear that they are looking for more triggers. So when I work on sanctions, uh, and I do work on sanctions, uh, I'll, uh, I'm talking to them uh, and they are asking to give more triggers. And the last trigger that I gave them, it was about a month ago, our partners, uh, they released a leaked tape uh, about building concentration camp in Belarus uh, by Lukashenko. And uh, I sent that information uh, to Brussels and then I had a conversation with them. And uh, when I asked about new round of sanctions, uh, I was told, but can, I, can you, Natalia, give us uh, more triggers? And I almost got stuck, like, because... I just two days ago sent information about building concentration camp in Belarus. And uh, what else and what is additional trigger might be? And my answer was, so do I understand correctly that uh, this concentration camp has to be open and people have to be killed there in order for EU not to lose time and not to waste time as EU is doing. And it's not only about EU. I'm talking about all states, holders and governments. And also, well, politicians need to stop choosing their favorite dictator. Uh, because uh, currently in Belarus, we have 258 political prisoners. Situation is developing in Russia as well. And uh, everyone is forgetting about Belarus. Uh, and concentrating on the main, their favorite dictator as Putin. Because of course, when uh, world leaders are dealing with Putin, it's a major uh, game changer for their reputation. And what is happening with their reputation when they do with deal with Lukashenko? So um, it's just to conclude that it's uh, very important to understand that there are no uh, favorite dictators, all of them, are bloody dictators who uh, kidnap and kill people, torture and rape them. And if situation in Belarus will not be resolved, there will be no possibility to resolve situation in Russia and stop war in Ukraine and not a single chance to stabilize uh, Europe as a continent. And uh, it's necessary also to understand that people of Belarus made their choice on the 9th of August, not asking for help uh, from the West or Russia, they made their choice. They're fed up with Lukashenko. And currently what they're asking to do is the West to stop its kleptocracy and corruption because all people who support Lukashenko and Putin, uh, so-called money bags, they keep their money in Europe. So it's about stabilization of Europe and Europe must think about its stability. 
uh, and understand that while they keep those people inside of their countries, there is no safety. So there is unfortunately not a very positive ending on my side, but this is unfortunately the reality. Well, yeah, and if that I, is if I, if the I, situation. Yeah. Thank and you, Natalia. Thank you. And even like the I idea will, to make... Sorry, I will need to run because I need to jump on another call with Washington. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you so sharing. much. I'm very happy to be with you. Thank you so much. Stay and, safe, everyone. And even uh, if I would just want to add to what Natalia said, the idea to make, to, to make this into a book, uh, the story, uh, was born out of frustration because uh, a few years ago uh, I met uh, Masha Yesen, my collaborator on this project, over co and she asked me we were working on something else, and she asked she mentioned that she there's this feeder company I've seen their place before but I didn't know them personally, and here's this lesbian couple, and she asked me if I like if for, for ideas of where to publish this. Like where the story could be could be like an outlet, you know, media outlet. And I remember sitting thinking, it's like you know, this conversation happened in New York, and I was like sitting thinking, maybe Germany. On uh, true to like honest answer, like I was like, maybe Germany, and then I was like, just because Germany is close to Belarus, and but no one cares about Belarus, Germany still does through geography and whatnot. And I was just like, you know, and then in my head, I was like thinking of my, of the editors I knew in all in the publications like Stern and Spiegel. And I was like, nope, nope. Lesbians, Belarus, no news angle, no chance. This was my answer to Masha. But in the same conversation, I was like, you know, <laughs> but this could be a book. I don't think I could make this. I wouldn't because as a as a as a as a journalist, you don't want to email editors and have them say no to you more than you have to because people don't like to say no. So you try to think of like who might be interested. And I was like, no, 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 no. Maybe Germany. Nah, no, 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 no chance. And that's how it became a book. But actually, <laughs> so, that's a that's a point I wanted yeah. to ask uh, um, yeah. Gwendolyn as well. And um, Coming back to the one uh, uh, point about the next generation, I think you, um, is there a new, is this a whole new group of protesters, what uh, did the survey say? And then this other question maybe, um, which, uh, which was raised now, how, I mean, the, the, the public, it's, Belarus is not so much more in the public eye anymore, especially in Germany, we have uh, we have had uh, trouble before in um, telling people about Belarus. There was not a lot of knowledge um, about it. And it um, seems to be uh, going back to that, situ that situation. Is there, what do you think, um, also from a point of view of, a area, of area studies and science communication, how can, what can we do there to, um, to, to maintain an interest or... Um, I mean, maybe this, the first question, I think it's a really important one. And I think we all already addressed parts of this. I mean, is this a, a new generation? That's how you put the question of, of um, uh, protesters of politically engaged people. And I think the interesting thing is, and I think it was you, Misha, saying things are a little more complex than they look. And they, um, if you are um, an academic or a researcher, you see that's, that's, that's always the case. But the more you look at something, um, and it's not generation in a strict sense of the word. So it's not, um, that's at least what the data now shows. And I think that that chimes with what I can also see through um, kind of your images, Misha, or what, what um, uh, we've just heard also about um, uh, free theater. Um, it's not clearly, our trends are not clearly linked to age as such, but I think I would say use the word generation in the sense of a, a new generation of Belarusian citizens. and and demanding something and demanding change, although exactly the type of change is, is not um, uh, necessarily always clearly defined already. Because if we if we look at age, and, and you just gave us this, this nice example also on the Telegram and Instagram use of the old lady you met, and it, that's kind of the, the nice, that's how I think my data speaks to your images and, and experiences also as a, as a journalist, um, that we see that in the, in the media use. 
Um, we can see that statistically, yes, younger people are still more likely to use it, but I mean, that doesn't account for the sort of 70%. And if we look at other questions on the support for democracy, age has no effect that we can see. So it's, it's, it's obviously not just the young. Um, we, we see, uh, or we see among regime, we've created categories of regime critics and regime um, supporters, and, and we can see certain groups matter a lot. So among the regime critics and the, our students, for example, are very prominent, and it comes out through the data as well, but not necessarily age, that's not the young generally. So that's more in that sense an, an argument about um, um, education uh, playing a part, and maybe not surprisingly that, that um, we also observe in, in other protests, but um, or for political interest, actually older people say in our survey that they are more interested now in politics. So, so it goes in, 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 in different directions and it's not a clear correlation with age. So it's more sort of, I think, a general, no, different idea of what a new generation um, means. And in terms of your second question, and I think that's sort of why I, I'm, I'm uh, quite interesting also in these discussions we're having here now, now um, between different perspectives and actually to sort of carry on this, um, also the momentum uh, that to, to make, um, if we want to stay with the theatre language, the world stage realize, first of all, in, in Europe that Belarus is actually part of Europe and the geographical distance also between Berlin and Minsk is, is really small. Um, and so I think that has happened and something shifted. Um, I don't think it's that bleak now. It has disappeared again from the headline news. I think that's partly also because it's been become harder to, to actually um, uh, produce the images of what's happening and to capture small neighborhood actions looks different also as news coverage than mass protests of, of hundreds of thousands of people. But then I think the sort of the door has opened that we, we were aware and also a broader uh, part of society was aware for a while of Belarus. And, and on that basis, at least it's the next stage that I think um, uh, both uh, research, but also probably in your case, Misha, photography and journalism from afar, not only in, in Belarus, and also again, the Belarus Free Theatre in the UK and internationally can pick up on and people will have that effect. But on the other hand, I think it becomes even more necessary to do this because it is in a way quite frightening how it turns to normality. I mean, even mass mobilization of society becomes more normality, we got used to it images um, are not really available and then the discussion stops and it of course yeah. shouldn't be like that. And, you know, journalism always chases, you know, like the latest, the hottest, the, uh, the craziest piece of news today. And what, you know, one way of maintaining interest and, you know, before I got into Belarus, uh, you know, like this, 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 this feeder company, you know, they would come to important festivals, they would come to New York, New York Times would write about them and give them glowing reviews. And that, that they, you know, before I knew them, I knew of them. And through, through, through theater, through photography, there are many different means of supporting uh, artists uh, through, you know, allowing us to do essentially research, you know, it's essentially research to continue, you know, it's, you can't expect, you know, in journalism for a topic that's important to an activist to just appear in the newspaper every day. That's not, that wouldn't be fair to the readers because, but there are other ways and there are other ways, you know, just again, to support what we do and to support the sort of activism that and sort of research that companies like the Belarusian Free Theater does, and they they do an excellent job in keeping, you know, like their their topic of interest, you know, relevant and uh, and they they do have support of a lot of celebrities in UK and in US who who do a, you know their masters at it. And you know, these days and age, this kind of attention is, you know, more precious than an article in the back of a newspaper that no one will really care enough. You know, and uh, 
I don't mean to sound like a cynic. It's more of like I'm, you know, it's my job to be skeptical. <laughs> um, well, I suppose it's my my job too. But I, I just wanted to one thing you said that triggered this in my head. I mean, if you think if an article isn't read, and then clearly most academic publications are read by very few people. But nevertheless, I think um, I mean one is the 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 also the feeling that when something like this happens, also as a researcher, you are um, obliged to kind of speak up, and if this is your yeah. area of interest, to do it. But also. I think uh, the fact that now, I mean, scholars working on protests, I mean, not specifically working on Belarus, uh, this is now becoming become a, a major um, sort of case is the word we use. It sounds a bit too detached, but it's a, it's a major example now. And it really raises questions which scholars who study protest in various parts of the world can't easily answer sort of this, what has maintained this for so long. So there are surprising questions that come from this example if you're actually not attached to the, the yeah. country at all. And I think that will stay. So that's also one way of, of recognizing some of the elements, what, what has shifted in our perception and what has shifted in the perception of a, also of a whole research um, agenda. And that will stay. That will unfortunately not have um, impact on the situation right now. But I think it changes perceptions over a longer period of time. And from the perspective of media, you know, we ourselves, uh, you know, looking back, you know, I covered the region for, for a while now, and to use like American political language, Belarus was always flyover country. You know, it's where a place that you fly, you know, when you go to Moscow, when you go into Kiev and cover events there, Belarus, you know, never really had pure, you know, you never really had international journalists based in Minsk, you know, and you're not going to have them there anytime soon it's always going to be even when you know it's always going to be split between moscow and warsaw and you know belarus was a place where you went you know like when i look back at my colleagues once every 10 years when there is another crackdown you go for a day you freeze and you go home you know and then you don't talk about it again and you know in the beginning we you know, myself, I mean, I'm just going to talk about it myself. You can't, I can't help but, you know, like you're in Minsk, you're watching this and you think, well, what's, what happened in, you know, in, in, during the Georgian revolution or, or Maidan in Ukraine or Kyrgyz or, or Moscow protest. And you, and you kind of expect what the next steps would be. And then things don't really work out exactly the way you, you assumed they would. And then it just occurs to you, well, you just I, I even though I made this book and I befriended a lot of people and spent some time in Belarus, I've never really studied Belarus properly. You know, Belarus was always something, well, you know, they look they're post-Soviet and they look like Russian, but they're a little bit more provincial and they're a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But my own understanding of the country was very limited, despite oh. everything. And and I was like I just said to myself, I'm not gonna, you know, no more, you're not gonna hear me give, like, Belarusians will not uh, hear, have me give them a kind of advice or opinions on what they should do. You know, I'm here to learn and report and, and report back to the world of what I see, but I'm not, uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that recording and your photo photography with us and your views. And um, I think with this, uh, we, we, we shall con conclude. And it's definitely, um, uh, we should definitely keep the discussion on Belarus um, going. Um, but for now, um, I would uh, like to say thank you and goodbye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking, thank you for taking an interest in my work. Thank you.